Okay. Uh, thank you for coming. Um, Brittany Hunter, who is going to, is, you notice that it, on here, I pulled up one of my old files that talks about more management issues in tunnels. Um, and this one is going to be basically, you know, kind of exploring this temperature related stuff. Um, Brittany was one of my graduate students, and she now is an extension educator in uh, Davis County, and we're kind of farming off some of the outreach effort to her um, because she's so knowledgeable about it. We've had a lot of students and a lot of agents that have worked with us over the years on these projects. Um, and today what I really want to do is look at these aspects of uh, I'm not going to do a, the design aspect because that's going to take a lot longer. So we're, there's a lot of designs that are out there, but I want to basically give you an overview of what a tunnel does, how they work, how to manage them, and then she was going to give you actually some, some major strategies for cropping in them. And my other presentation just uh, 45 minutes ago that we went through, we talked a little bit about it, but it was most, mostly focused on uh, economics and so that is in your your handout there that presentation and you can look at it um, and so uh, we're not going to get into any construction tips but I have a lot of those so the key thing to remember about high tunnels is they're not greenhouses and in fact you don't want them to be a greenhouse and there's reasons for that because there are different zoning regulations for greenhouses relative to a removable temporary structure like a tunnel. And you need to know that because the minute you pull power to that structure, the zoning regulations change for it and people think of it differently and they're going to tax it potentially different. So that's an important consideration for it. So it's not a greenhouse. Don't ever call it a greenhouse in anything you write. Don't do that because somebody's going to think of it differently. You know, it's, uh, we don't heat the thing. Um, we uh, basically uh, heat it through the sun coming into it, and we cool it by opening doors and, and ventilating sides and doing those types of things. We put fans in it, it's a greenhouse again. They think of it as a greenhouse. You know, city planners only know buildings, and they don't want, we don't want them to think about this as a building. Um, it's, not, it's sometimes called a cold frame. Um, it's not a low tunnel. Because a low tunnel is basically a structure that would cover individual plants or a, a series of plants. This covers a, a much bit bigger area. But we do put low tunnels inside high tunnels. Okay? And we can grow a diverse range of crops in them. And certainly we want to build them in such a way or you want to purchase ones that allow you to do things with existing equipment. You don't want to have to go out and try and buy special equipment for them. So we have some small tractors uh, that you know, fit in them. And so we build the end walls and the doors in such a way that we can run that tractor in. This is a 12, 15 horsepower tractor that's relatively low profile. It'll run a three foot or four foot uh, tiller behind it. Um, and, and we can basically drive it in and drive it out. It takes me less than 10, it takes me more time to turn around to get back into the tunnel on either end than it does to till the ground. I can do it that quickly and, and that saves money. The next thing that we're going to do is we bought ourselves a low, small, very small, compact plastic layer. And the idea is it will also go behind this tractor. And now I can lay the plastic and the drip tape and all that stuff by machine rather than by hand, which we've done up in Denial. That changes my labor profile. It means more equipment, but it changes some other things. Um, how, does a greenhouse, uh, how does this greenhouse tunnel type structure from a heating perspective work? Well, the sunlight brings in shortwave radiation. And the key thing to a tunnel is to have as much surface area under that as possible. So in effect, the more space we have under the tunnel, the more heat we're going to trap in that structure. So to a certain extent, width and length are important to you. Um, because what we're trying to do is we're trying to warm up this brown line as that soil. And we're going to capture shortwave radiation by heating things inside the tunnel, and the primary thing you have in your tunnel is soil. And then when you have plants in there, you're going to warm the plants up as well because they absorb some of that shortwave radiation. Okay? Then what happens at night? Um, 
some of that shortwave radiation, the heat from that gets converted to long wave radiation. That's why we got the bigger squiggly line. And it tends to go up into the tunnel and that keeps the air warm at night. And some of it actually passes out. That's why it starts to cool down over time. But a lot of it gets reflected back into the structure. So it's this concept of physics. Who knows anything about physics here? Nobody, a few people do. They've had their physics class, but it's short wave in, you want that, clear days, heat that soil up, and store as much energy in that soil as possible, and then reflect that around inside that tunnel. Um, and it's gonna cycle its way through there, um, and we're going to kind of use that, and we're, we're not really heating the air per se, but we're heating things within it, and we're seeing that response as a result of that. So here's some one of the growers, or one of our, our colleagues down in Panguitch. You know how warm it is in Panguitch, right? It's, uh, you know, it's the subtropics down there. Um, and you, know, you can see, here's a bunch of dates. He recorded temperatures for us one year. Well, outside temperature was minus 14 Fahrenheit. Colder than cold, right? Um, what was the temperature inside that structure, he said? It was 15 degrees. That's a 30 degree difference, right? So that's what's going on, so that's, that's huge. Okay, well, 15, can we grow something at 15? Probably not, okay, well, that doesn't matter. So, but notice that, the effect that there. Now, look at on the 15th of March. It was kind of a snowy, cloudy day there. The low temperature was 17, the high temperature inside the structure when you're snowing and you got cloud cover and those types of things. Why is that? Not much radiation is coming into that structure. And so we're going to have these variabilities, and what we're trying to do is create an environment that allows us to have a large difference between our outside and our inside temperature um, on a consistent basis. So what do we need to basically look at is we need to know our environment because once we start to know more about what our temperature environment is like, then we can start to strategize as to when we should start planting. And that's always the big question that I get from growers. Well, when should I start planting my tomatoes? I've got plants ready today. Should I put them out today? Well, if you were in St. George, you should have done it a month ago. If you're in the Salt Lake Valley, you may want to, you know, you might be getting close to that date, particularly if you do some, some uh, specific things in there. So good thermometers, good records, and we can actually go to you know, general climatic data, if you're so interested in, you know, kind of telling me what the things that you need to do and stuff, we can start to strategize as to when you should do certain things. So we get these differences um, at different times of the year and those are important for us. So how do we mitigate that temperature even more? Um, one of the things that he does down there is he uses these frost blankets so that we're getting this long wave radiation in, heating the soil, um, and then we're going to reflect that back up and we're going to capture it underneath some other type of structure. And we can see the effect of this on these plants. Notice when he was planting his greens, it went all the way out to the edge of the, the tunnel. But notice what's going on out here. It's covered out there, but we're not getting any growth out there because it's really cold up against that. Why is it so cold up against the outside of these structures? Effectively, the heat of the tunnel melts some snow during the daytime. The snow tends to run down the side of the tunnel and then it subs back into the structure as a result of its melting. And it's that cold, dense, wet environment that those plants are gonna have to cope with. And you know how, you know, water doesn't boil instantly, right? It takes a lot of energy to boil water. Well it takes a lot of sunlight to warm that soil back up enough to make these plants capable of growing. But as you move a little bit farther into the tunnel, and it's usually about a one and a half foot of, um, a distance usually that we see where we start getting better growth again. And so one of the approaches we've taken with our tunnels is to, when we're constructing them, trench out along the outer edge, take some foam board at least a two feet deep, um, just use a ditching uh, tool, uh, rent one, wrap that foam board in some plastic, slap it in that hole, push it up against the outside, backfill it, and leave it up about that much out of the soil so that when you're running your tiller through there, you don't knock it off all the time. You'll see it, 
but we've been able to then squeeze our production out to the edge of the tunnel a lot more just by doing that. Uh, mainly we put it along the sides and not the end walls and the reason is because if you notice up on the end walls I'm gonna walk there a lot I gotta get in into the tunnel and get out of the tunnel so I've got a kind of a setback up at that zone and and uh, leave it from there. Uh, one inch is good enough just it, anything to just try and create a barrier for that in migration of water. Question? Okay. At the end then. Just inside. Yeah, just inside, yep. So the main thing we're trying to do with these things is manage tunnels and there's lots of ways for us to do that. Um, effectively our high tunnel does that. Uh, certainly inside the tunnel or outside the field we can put floating row covers. We may use low tunnels inside and outside in the field as well as we saw in some of our presentations today. Um, basically to try and create a secondary level to get those plants to grow and then certainly we need to be thinking about ventilation and the way we ventilate is effectively just push up the sides we got strings that hold the plastic down over the the, the thing of the the tunnel and then we'll just put a little uh, support board um, just to push that up and hold it up and we may ventilate both sides on a really hot day we may only ventilate one side on a rather cool day we might only open up the end wall if all of uh, the tunnel designs that we work with have a door but they also have a vent up in the top so we can just open that vent just quickly fold that down to any distance and, and, and get some of that extra heat out of that tunnel. The vents in the top are nice because that's where all your heat is anyway in the tunnel and it works you know rather effectively. When it starts getting too warm in here we'll have to lift these low tunnels up a little bit to make sure that we're not overheating those plants because we're trapping lots of energy in that structure. And ultimately we're looking at growth and we're basically trying to prevent cold injury if we look at um, strawberry, here's a picture of strawberries, we don't want black eye in strawberry. That's frozen tissue that's been damaged, no fruit. So we don't like that. And if we're um, growing any plant, we need to kind of know what the low temperature is where that plant gets injured or where part of that plant that we're interested in gets injured. Um, we want to keep the temperature above the base because that's when the plant's going to start to grow. So the longer each day we can get our temperature above that base temperature, the more growth we're going to get. And that's effectively what we're doing. We want to keep it in that optimal range. And that's why we need to know what plant we're growing, what the requirements are for these crops, what that range is so that we can target in on that on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, and then we've got to be managing that structure so that we're cooling it when it gets too hot or we're closing it up when it gets too cold so that we're having long periods of time every day. And then ultimately um, what we're doing for those things is high tunnels, low tunnels, and row covers help us move away from this ba base temperature into this optimal zone. And when we're getting too hot and we're starting to see suppression of growth because our temperatures are above the optimum, then we need to ventilate um, to try and drive those temperatures back. We may actually have to shade those crops as well. And so essentially in the summer what we do is pull the plastic off. It takes two people 10 minutes to pull the plastic off. And it takes the same two people maybe 20 minutes to put the shade on. And so in a, in a short period of time we can go from essentially indoor production to outdoor production. Because in the summer why grow them indoors? Why stress yourself over the temperatures that are underneath this? Make them grow like they're outdoors you need to monitor it. So we say get a thermometer that you can put it in and a, a, one of those cheap meat thermometers that we use for our, is a really good one. They're digital, they're fairly accurate. You can probe to the rooting depth or the, the, the planting depth, kind of instantly look around in your house and we normally say measure it somewhat time between noon and two o'clock. That's going to be about where your temperature is kind of mid-range. If you wait later in the day it's going to go a little bit higher than that and and so you use that. Let's look at some examples here. Um, we're going to look at a tomato example, the minimum temperature where growth will start down, down here 
is right around 40 degrees Fahrenheit, so we want to try and keep it above 40. Um, it, so there's uh, injury level, there's our base temperature uh, for tomato, um, there's our optimal zone, so we can, you know, deal with 40, but we don't like it. We'd prefer to be 50, we prefer to be in this range, but we don't want to be in that range, because we know that that's when certain parts of the plant get injured. So as the summer, as we move into the summer, yeah, it's going to get warmer in there, but you have to remember that the tunnel, it does that much, much earlier in the year, and so that's where your ventilation, where your shade, where those types of things are, and our goal is to try and achieve that uh, for a longer period of time each day, um, and we can actually achieve that in the late season uh, for those plants, and our ones that aren't this line right here, these are ones that are not uh, being as well protected, and they're not meeting that optimum long enough each day, and therefore that's going to affect the ripening and those phenomena that we're after. If we were to look at strawberry, blossoms get injured at about 30 to 32. They start growing about 40. The optimal is about 70. So would I want to grow tomato and strawberry in the same tunnel house? Would you? Yes, no? No. You know, really you have to find and pick similar type crops to grow in them. Now that's the first thing that most people make mistakes on. They grow too diverse a range of crops in these tunnels. Now, for tomato example, that's pretty close to what our pepper example would be. So I would say, yeah, you could get tomatoes and peppers and maybe even eggplant growing in the same house together because they're similar. If you're growing cucurbits, you might grow squash and, and cucumbers together in the same house because they have very similar temperature requirements. But I wouldn't mix my squash and my tomatoes together because they're really too different again from each other. And so we need to understand that and that changes then the dynamics of um, what you're going to try and do. Now I notice a few of you are busily scratching things down on paper. Um, I'm going to make sure that this gets posted on our website so that the, the presentation is there. We're recording it as well. So both of those will go up and there'll be like a little YouTube video with the slides and the, pre, the, the verbal stuff that I've talked about so that you'll have this and you can go back and reference it because we're kind of moving a little fast for not having it right in front of you. So let's talk about some cropping options. I think Brittany was going to talk about those kinds of scenarios. Certainly perennial based plants are an option. I know in Europe they're growing fruit trees under it, they're starting to grow cherries and peaches and those kind of crops under plastic up in the northwest, just basically because one rain event can ruin a cherry crop. Right? Now we don't often have that here, but that's a possibility. We're growing raspberries, we're growing blackberries, we're growing strawberries, but if you only have uh, if you're growing blackberries and raspberries, you're talking perennials. Now you've locked yourself into a particular crop for the long term. And that may not be the best option for you. Um, and uh, it, it, there are other issues that are tied with this. We do have some publications on our tunnel.usu.edu website that will uh, talk about some of these vet, uh, fruiting cropping options. Uh, strawberry, um, it's a planted in the late summer, um, grows through the winter, cropped into the next early summer. Um, and so it kind of ties up the tunnels and interferes with your ability to maybe grow tomatoes uh, if you only have one tunnel. So you might have to have more than one of these and that's where you need to be thinking about it. Some of the other cropping options, Certainly tomato has been a, a very popular one by growers. That tends to be the one. If we look at tunnel acreage across the United States, uh, I think the numbers are about 65 to 70 percent of all the tunnel acreage in the United States is dedicated to tomato. Okay, so it's a popular one. There's a little bit of interest in squash. Certainly in the winter, um, all of these cool weather crops like um, Chinese cabbage and lettuce and and spinach and uh, bok choys and some of the kales and mustards type plants are really good options there because they can take the cold temperatures and they don't have a very high temperature uh, very warm temperature requirement and they're actually quite tolerant to the cold 
even the below freezing type conditions, they get conditioned to that. Um, so the key thing for us is to come back to these critical temperatures. Here are a range of crops that are being grown across the United States in tunnels. We have lettuce and spinach, cabbages and broccoli, uh, carrots, parsnips, and other rooting crops, beets and chard, and other related uh, species, onions, garlics, um, peas. Uh, I know of a couple growers that are growing rhubarb for very early in the season. They're forcing asparagus in these. They build their tunnel over their asparagus patch because they want to have really, really early asparagus and they have specific market requirements. We've got strawberries and raspberries. All of those are basically in the cool weather cra cropping group, but they do tend to have some differences in terms of their minimums, optimals, and uh, maximal temperature regimes, and we kind of have to look at that. Warm weather crops, by far, tomatoes are most important. Had a few growers that have tried to grow melons in tunnels. It doesn't work too good because bees don't like to fly under plastic. Certainly the honeybee doesn't, but some of our natives do. So there's differences, and if you can harbor and listen to, to what Corey was talking about with encouraging bee populations in your neighborhood, we do see quite a few uh, natives flying around in there. It's surprising, you know, you wouldn't think about it, so that helps with your set. But you have to understand, melons need to be cross-pollinated. You have males and female flowers, and you need to get pollen from one to the other. You can do that by hand, it's a lot of extra work, and labor costs are some of your biggest costs with this. Summer squashes, we do have some um, germplasm that uh, will set fruit without pollination. That's a unique thing. There are specific ones that will do that, so you need to look for that um, when you're looking through your seed catalogs because not all summer squash does well in a tunnel. So you, you need to look for ones that will set without fertilization. Cucumber can, be, can work for you. So I've known some people to try some sweet corn, but I don't see the value of sweet corn in one. Uh, beans can work. Basil will work really well because it complements some of the other things we do. And then there's these other crops as well that could potentially go underneath there. So the key thing that you need to think about with the cool weather crops is that many of them start germinating at really low temperatures. They're pretty small plant sizes. And this is probably the most important is that they're not subject to cold injury. Most of them are quite tolerant. Lettuce, a little less, it will take some cold. Spinach, we've grown spinach and had temperatures down to minus 15 and the plant's completely frozen and it starts to thaw out in the morning and then it keeps growing from there. So we've done some really, really neat studies with that. I wish I could tell you about them, but it will really take the cold and there are a bunch that will do that. Kale is another one. So the key thing is we don't have to get very warm to get growth out of these but we can't get very hot because if we get too hot it actually suppresses growth and particularly as we move into late February into March the temperature in those tunnels that yesterday we had temperatures in our tunnels that uh, we weren't the guy that works for us wasn't watching the temperature very much and we were 85 90 degrees in the tunnel by 11 o'clock in the morning and and it was only 25 in Logan yesterday for a high so that's a 50 degree difference that you have in there. There was no wind, the tunnel was completely closed up and the temperature went through the roof. So you got to manage them and they got to be ventilated and we're ventilating already, you know, on a cold day. And, but it doesn't have to be much, just enough to pull some of that heat out of there. Upper limits are, are critical for us and when we do that, get that, then you'll start getting burning along the margin of the leaf, which affects your quality and your appearance and that affects your marketability. The warm crops, the key thing is many of these crops when we get temperatures less than 50 have a problem. That's why we put our tomatoes under a secondary tunnel in the, in the main tunnel just to try and hold that temperature up a little bit more. Um, and then the upper limits is going to vary because bean flowers actually get damaged at about 83 degrees Fahrenheit. The bean plant doesn't set fruit as well when the temperature gets that high. Tomato can take about 87 um, temp degrees, but a melon can take about 92. And then it starts getting. So that's why you really don't want to mix them, because which one is more valuable to you? The bean, the tomato, the melon? You have to make those decisions, and you mix them in the house 
And, and it may not set as well for one as for the other, and that then affects your productivity level. So that becomes a critical thing for you to think about as you're growing in these tunnels. This is a pretty detailed table. It will be up on the website, so don't worry about it. But what it does is it kind of gives you these optimal ranges, and you can see that it varies depending on the species that we're growing. And, and therefore, as you're thinking about your tunnels, um, the more diversity you have in a tunnel, the worse off you are. That's just the reality of it because of the, the variations that are out there. Um, and, and they're optimal zones. You can start to pick them out a little bit more closely to each other, but too often we have a diverse range of things that we want, and then I don't know how to manage the tunnel. Okay, so that, I've got that, and it'll go up on the website for you so that you can, can look closely at that um, and, and understand that a little bit better. Uh, temperature and growth, so kind of when we're looking at, these were germination temperatures, kind of more tied to that, and that's critical for us as we try to think about some crops that we would seed in the tunnel to get them to establish themselves. They're kind of all over the board. I think the ones that are more important for you um, are some of these, uh, you know, how the cool season ones respond. You can see that some of them have a lower minimum they have uh, a different range in the optimums, you know, and, and therefore you could kind of say, well, I'm going to pick the center line and maybe I'll be okay. That might work for a while, but you're going to find that over time you're not going to be happy with that. And so I would, you know, kind of counsel against too much diversity in the thing unless we can, you know, maybe grow, if we're growing things like, let's say, some really early broccoli, cabbage, um, kale, so maybe some kohlrabis which are all really closely related to each other. All of those brassicas, you might be able to get by with something like that. Warm season crops, you can see the same thing. You know, there's kind of broader, narrower temperature regimes where the optimums are. They tend to fluctuate a little bit. Um, so if you can kind of target in on some that are similar, you're going to be better off when you do your diversity. But um, uh, once again, it can be somewhat problematic. So if we think about some of the timelines, I think this is what Brittany was really going to uh, focus some of her att attention on, was to say, well, what should our options look like? Um, I used this slide in the previous talk that I had next door, um, but I didn't really describe it too closely. So if we were going to seed lettuce um, or transplant lettuce, you know, and I wanted some early ones, I might say, well, I could start seeding somewhere in this January or February time range, but my big problem at that time is I'm not getting that much solar radiation in. The angle of the sun is too low in the sky. The length of the day is too short because of the time frame of the year it is. Um, I got a lot of cloudier weather at that time, uh, so I'm going to have to put some type of secondary structure in there to try and warm the soil up a little bit more or to, in order to get that to germinate, and that may or may not work for me. These are based on Logan, yeah, so that, that's why I said, you know, look at your environment. If you were in Cedar City, it's going to be different. You're maybe going to have a similar type of temperature regimes, but your sun angle is a little bit higher because you're a little bit farther south, and so that's going to change the energy dynamics that are in there and orientation plays a big role in this. Um, you know, the aspect of the land, if you kind of have a more south-facing aspect relative to a north-facing aspect, those are all going to change your dynamics, and those are all things that you need to evaluate on your property as you decide on the location that you're going to put this structure. It will. The one problem that we have seen over time is that um, when we were first working with it, we used an awful lot of reme in our structures, and when we looked at the temperature dynamics, we actually saw that the temperature underneath that structure was cooler during the day than it was if we didn't have it there. And the main reason for that was long, short wave radiation comes in and it heats this dark soil, just like your dark car gets warmed up. We have this white colored thing, it reflects more of that, and we don't store as much heat, and so it's actually a little bit cooler underneath there. So when we're trying to germinate things like lettuce or, or spinach or something like that, actually what we do is we put clear plastic now over top of it, because now we have a secondary structure, the short wave is passing through that structure and, and warming that soil up, and we actually get better germination. 
So, but we like the cooling aspect of it if we already have the plants in place, because then we, don't, we can get by with not maybe having to ventilate nearly as much. And so we've got plants actually growing underneath here. They, they do like that because it's slightly cooler. We don't have to worry as quite as much about our management. Um, only UV stuff that we use in our tunnel is our outside plastic on the greenhouse itself. After that, cost is the key. The cheapest plastic will work for you. Okay? Yes. We've been looking for a little bit of money to be able to do that, and we were going to retro some of our tunnels to have that and then look at those temperature dynamics. And I'm hoping that we can maybe put those in sometime this summer, and then we can next winter run that. So at next year's, I'm hoping to report on that. That's one of our goals, you know, those automatic vents that you can put in that are kind of temperature dependent ones, and then also uh, maybe a fan that's run off solar power to just basically kick on when the certain temperature comes in to just give you a break, because that's the thing that kills us even. We have to have somebody manage these every, every day of the week you're working on this, so. So Rime, Agrabond, they're all basically a, a similar type thing. They just may have the plastics that they develop them out are slightly different, but they have the same properties. Okay, so temperature stress, what kind of things happen when we have temperature stress? Well, you see in P, this little seed that doesn't develop, that's a high temperature response. We get poor set. So then that affects pod shape. And if I'm growing snap beans or green beans in my tunnel, and, I, and my market says, I really like those straight beans, I don't really like the ones that are crooked like this, What's wrong with your bean? Why is it crooked like that? There's something wrong with it. There's nothing wrong with it. It's just that one of those pod, seeds in the pod didn't get set and therefore it distorts the shape and the growth rate of it and your customer doesn't understand that and it, you have to take a lot of time to explain to them that there's nothing wrong with it and that's a, not, a lost sale to the next guy. So how do we grow good seeds and good pods? Well, we try to get all the seeds to set. Well, if we don't if we don't uh, get our temperatures quite right, that changes that dynamic. Um, overheating in broccoli, you'll get that in a tunnel. We've seen that with some people where the temperature gets too hot, the flowers develop a lot faster, you get a loose open head and it doesn't meet market requirements. So managing that temperature becomes a key thing to what you're doing. And then if you're going through, um, this just reminds me of this flowering with these biennials, that sometimes the temperature changes from cold to hot will trigger the plants to flower prematurely. And so that may be a problem for you, particularly we see that in early spring spinach in tunnels sometimes. They'll start to bolt on us a lot quicker than you, you thought they would um, just because of the dynamics of temperature in there. And all of those kind of things happen. Um, our warm season crops, when we have low temperatures, the types of injuries that we'll see, we'll see uh, leaf damage uh, to uh, melons in the tunnel, that's a cold weather response. We're transplanting early or squash, um, they're chilled. You saw this picture already where, you know, there's this border effect. And if you have cold temperatures during early set of some of our fruit crops, you get a disorder we call cat facing. And that's, um, some of those cells just don't grow because it's too cold or they've been injured. And now you get these gnarly looking fruits. Unless you're a clever marketer, you might be able to sell that because you created some interest in it. And uh, it's, it's, you can do it, but you have to change the mind of the consumer. And the consumer is used to perfect produce, right? To them, that doesn't look perfect. They'd eat that out of their own garden because it's come out of their garden. The, the consumer is the nuttiest person on the earth, I, I've always said because in his own garden he'll eat any of these things, but if he has to pay for it, uh, -uh I'm paying for that, even though I know that's there and it's early and it's all the things that you say, it's nutritious, it's local, it's organic, it's, you know, whatever. You know, you, you gotta, gotta change, we gotta change our customer's mindset somehow. What do high temperature things do to some of our crops? Um, a little later on, Sam's gonna, my grad student's presently gonna talk about sunburn problems. That's a big one. And sunburn doesn't just affect fruiting crops, but it also affects many of our leafy crops too, because you'll see scorching on the leaf and leaf margin and those kinds of things. Uh, we'll get um, 
green core that shows up, which is superheated cells, but they, and they stay yellowish, and it just goes down into the fruit, and it looks bad. Uh, blossom end rot, which is heat-related and water-related combination thing, and so that becomes an unmarketable product. Um, you know, we'll see it on squash in the field where you get this superheated bleaching and blanching that occurs, and, and ultimately none of those products are marketable to you. And in a, and and seed set, the picture with the corn here just is kind of we got to remember that any crop that sets a pod like a bean or a pea or something like that, if it's too hot and some of those cell or some of those ovules don't get fertilized, then you have a mist. Um, seed to being developed and then it distorts the shape of it and so in corn if it gets too hot oftentimes we don't get tip fill on the end of the thing but we get that curvature in those bean pods which then creates a second it becomes a second or maybe a non marketable product and that just affects your productivity um, does design matter a little bit on this I don't think so there's all kinds of designs um, there's all kind of cost structures that go with them. Certainly the NRCS has a really nice program for um, cost sharing or even outright purchase of them. You know, look into those kinds of things. Our design is relatively inexpensive. Uh, costs of the material costs are less than $800 to build a 100 foot long tunnel that's uh, 14 feet wide, um, easy access, um, relatively mobile stands up reasonably well to the wind, um, uh, bears the snow load if you put some support legs inside of it so that you know when they, you do get some snow on it, tends to shed it reasonably well when the sun comes up. But you know, any amount of snow can cause something to collapse. You know, we're looking at that. We you know, want a certain amount of height. One of the things that we have seen with some of the taller structures is you have to remember what heat does, right? I, I would prefer to have my sofa up near the ceiling of my house. Why? Because in the winter, it seems a little, I like to lay on the floor after, it's cold on the floor and it's hot up here. So how do I get myself up here? That's what I kept asking myself. Well, we turn on a fan or something like that. So too tall is a problem. We've seen that in some of our bigger tunnels, like this one back here, that the heat profile is way up in the top and it's not as warm down here as we would like sometimes. So that there can be too tall and some of these you know bigger wider structures they gotta have a certain amount of height with them otherwise the roof is too flat and then if you get snow on them what do they do? They collapse in on you. So, so those are the kind of issues and you want to get enough side ventilation where you can lift up this side structure so that you can get the airflow through that thing. Well, we, we do a little bit of, uh, little slight modifications. Um, we basically, most of the time we attach the plastic around here, so it gets fastened at this point, up the door frame, around the top, down here. Recently we've been attaching it just, we put a permanent piece of plastic on the end wall, and then we attach it just to this outer frame. So you only have a few screws to unscrew there, a few on the other one, untie your strings, and roll it off. That takes us 15 minutes maximum. Yeah, so, so, so that's one. Brent, did you have something? Yeah, and then always, we always just write that. Then it goes on exactly the same way, and know which is the inside and which is the outside, because it helps. Um, your little tricks. So just attaching it around there, and then when we put our shade cloth back on top of it, we just put that and screw it back around that, throw a few strings over the top, then that, the shade is, is what it needs to be. These big houses, you know, we can get a lot of air through there because essentially we can ventilate up to this hip board. This whole window opens, this whole window opens, but, and we can put vents up here as well, but there's an awful lot of heat that sits up here, and sometimes we run into problems down low. And that one is 18 feet? Yeah, 17 or 18 feet. And we are growing blackberries and raspberries in these, and we get canes that are 10, 12 feet tall, so we thought, well, more space is going to be good. Then it's a picking problem. Then it's something else that comes up. So it's better for us to make the mistakes than to have you guys make them. It's a beast to put it on and take it off. Yeah. So they become. So yeah. So that's that. Um, well, 
just to give you a quick pictures, I'm almost out of time here. I want to just show you this. Here is uh, 15th of February, transplanted spinach around the 1st of January. This is the amount of growth that we have under a little low tunnel. That's the amount of growth where we don't have any cover. They're growing, they're putting on new leaves, but we got three times as much growth just with that little structure inside it. Transplanted spinach on the 1st of, right around the 1st of January, okay? This, was, this has been harvestable for weeks. This is barely at the range where we could harvest it yet. That's plastic, with no row cover. We find it doesn't grow nearly as well underneath it. Uh, and it's all due to this temperature effect. You know, so here's the air temperature in the tunnel. Here's the tunnel without any, um, with no cover, and that's the extra temperature that we get, and it's warmer for a longer period of time, and that's the goal. So if you can take everything, I'm not going to do that. Um, and oh, let me just finish with this. Structural integrity, it does happen. This is one of our tunnels. The, a student didn't latch the back door. The wind came out of, the, out of the Green Canyon, got inside the tunnel. We stood out there, the little boy there is my technician's kid, and they stood out there and it was blowing like crazy and they watched it just go flop. We just were getting ready to plant tomatoes in that house. It took us about two hours to kind of put it back together and we planted tomatoes the next day. So it happens. Snow load, just put some of this, uh, put some of these uh, support underneath there and they just tied loosely to the main so that they carry a little bit of the load. Um, and then make it sure that you get the openings big enough so that you can me start to mechanize things. So many of our bigger growers like a bigger house because they can put their full-size tractor through it. You know, labor is, is uh, uh, trying to reduce labor is important for you. Okay, I am out of time, right? Or I got two minutes, maybe. Yeah. Two minutes, okay. Two questions or three questions, start there. All of that is on the, our website. Go to tunnels.usu.edu. If you look at tomato, we're about anywhere from uh, four to six weeks early. Um, peppers for red ones were, you know, maybe two months early. So yeah, there's all of that's there. And then from the other end, we have it on that end too.